we began our study of categorical logic by looking at the basics. In other words, we took a look at what a categorical proposition is, how its constituent elements function, as well as how we can visually represent a categorical proposition, that is by way of a Venn diagram. We also took a look at what's known as existential import and the concept of distribution. We now move on to look at the immediate inferences known as the square of opposition. Now recall from our previous discussion of existential import that the universal proposition, affirmative and negative, can be understood as allowing for or assuming a member of the subject class to exist or allowing for the existence of a member of the subject class or not. So we can look at, for example, the difference between the statement, all werewolves are frightening creatures, where we do not, in our ordinary ways of thinking, assume that werewolves actually exist, or what we would think if we did assume that werewolves actually exist. Or let's take another example. All horses are equines. Here we take as our ordinary understanding the existence of at least one member of the subject class. In other words, we assume that there is at least one horse that exists as a member of the class of horses. But we could easily say that we won't make such an assumption. So we want to be able to look at two sets of inferences. One that does not assume existential import. That's what's known as the modern interpretation of the universal proposition. And one that does assume existential import. That is the traditional or Aristotelian interpretation of the universal proposition, both affirmative and negative. With that in mind, let's get started. Okay, so the modern square of opposition is the modern interpretation of the universal in terms of how we can or not make an inference from a universal affirmative to a universal negative and vice versa, universal affirmative to a particular negative and vice versa and so forth. Um, you'll see in a little bit why it's called a square of opposition. Uh, but for the moment, let's uh, just do a little bit of background work. Um, so when we're thinking about the sentence, all unicorns are mammals, we are thinking in terms of not assuming that the members, uh, or sorry, not assuming that the subject class has any existent mem members. Um, it might help you to think of the universal on the uh, universal affirmative uh, on the modern interpretation as saying if something is a unicorn then it is a mammal. We're not saying that any unicorns actually exist but if there were to be then this is how it would look. Uh, so take a look at the bottom of the page and you'll see or the bottom of the screen and you'll see two overlapping circles. The S circle represents the subject class and the P circle represents the predicate class of a um, uh, categorical claim, categorical proposition. And then the numbered areas are just those areas that we can diagram in specific ways in order to visually represent the logical structure of a claim. So in the case of all unicorns are mammals, we're going to diagram a part of the S circle as it relates to the distribution of S's into Okay, the P with that class. in mind, let's look at how you can diagram each of these claims. So notice uh, that in the upper left hand corner, you have a universal affirmative, an A proposition. In the upper right hand corner, you have a universal negative, or E proposition. In the lower left-hand corner, you have a, uni or, sorry, a particular affirmative or I proposition. 
and in the lower right hand corner you have the uh, O proposition that is the particular negative. Now um, first let's talk about let's let's talk about what we're seeing uh, and now that we've got our placement. Um, the shading, the blue, represents emptiness. In other words, um, and, and that's not really the best language to use, uh, but, but the shading tells us that there isn't anything here, there can't be anything here. So you want to think of the uh, shading as saying, if there are any S's, they'd all be dumped into the P class. So look at area two, that is the area of overlap in, of uh, S and P. In the area of overlap is the only open place or the only place available for any S's that may exist to actually be. So shading tells us that there's no there to put anything. There is nothing that we could put in the area of S that is outside of P. Now take a look at the E proposition immediately across from the A. Right? So the E proposition says no SRP. And that tells us that there is nothing you could put in the SP overlap area. That's because there can't be even one S that's a P or one P that's an S. Okay, let's go back to the universal affirmative. All S's are P's but we have not assumed a member of the subject class. That means that there's no inference we can make from the universal to the particular, which is the I proposition in the lower left corner. But if you look at the lower left corner, you'll notice that there is a member of the subject class that is also a member of the predicate class. How do you know this? Because there's an X in the overlap area. The X in the overlap area says there is at least one S that is also a P. Now, cast your eyes to the lower right hand corner. Notice there is an X in the area of S outside of P. That tells us that, that denotes that there is at least one S that is not a P. There is at least one S that the P class excludes from itself. So you've got these uh, three areas. Yes, technically there are four, but we're now talking about um, the relationship between S's and P's in terms of inclusion or exclusion uh, of uh, a member of the class or in terms of the entirety of the class. So we're not looking outside of the S and the P classes in their entirety. Okay, so when you look at the uh, uh, O proposition, notice that, again, there is a member of the S class. Now cast your eyes diagonally to the universal affirmative. If it's true that there is a member of the S class that's outside of the P class, then that means that the universal affirmative can't be true, right? Remember the universal affirmative says that there can't be anything in the area of S outside of P. So if the O proposition is true and there is a member of the S class outside of the P class, then the A proposition in the upper left corner must be false. You can see then also that the other direction uh, is equally contradictory. If it's the case that the A proposition is true, then the O proposition has to be false. These are known as contradictories. E and I are also contradictories. If the E proposition is true, then the I proposition must be false. If the I proposition is true, then the E must be false. I hope the diagrams help you see what the logical structure of each sentence is and also how it is that 
the logical structure of the I proposition and E proposition are not simultaneously true, not simultaneously false, they're contradictories. Also how the logical structure of the A and O propositions are contradictories. Here's how you can now see what we mean when we talk about a square of opposition. A's and O's are contradictories, E's and I's are contradictories. If the A is true, the O must be false. If the O is true, the A must be false. If the E is true, the I must be false. If the I is true, the E must be false. Any number of examples should be able, uh, sorry, any number of examples should suffice to help uh, you see how regardless of what the example is, right, so you can extrapolate from the examples, regardless of what the example is, uh, it's going to be the case that A's and O's and E's and I's are contradictories. Let's go ahead and look at some examples. So uh, A's and O's are contradictories. All zoos are places where animals are treated humanely. Contradicts the claim some zoos are not places where animals are treated humanely. E's and I's are also contradictories. The claim no zoos are places where animals are treated humanely contradicts the claim some zoos are places where animals are treated humanely. Here are some more examples that I hope um, make clear what contradictories look like. All nurses are medical professionals. Some nurses are not medical professionals. Some medical professionals are not nurses. All medical professionals are nurses. Now, if we operate uh, from the standpoint that we know the truth value of the uh, first proposition in each pair, then I hope it's the case that we see clearly that the second proposition in each, each pair can't be true. So if it's true, and we believe that it is, that nurses are medical professionals, then it can't be true to say that one of them is not. Similarly, if we say that some medical professionals are not nurses, and it's fair to say that that's a true claim, then it must be false that all medical professionals are nurses. But just remember that these examples are meant to sort of pump your intuitions about contradictories, but the content is not what makes these contradictories. Instead, the, what makes these contradictories are their logical structures. So take a look at the uh, second set, the E and the I, or sorry, the second two sets, the E and the I propositions. Let's assume it's true that no nurses are people available for jury duty this week. It must be false, therefore, that there is even one nurse available for jury duty this week. Similarly, if it's true that there is at least one nurse that is a certified phlebotomist, then it must be false that none of them are. We now move on to the square of opposition as well as the immediate inferences, conversion, contraposition, and obversion from the standpoint of the traditional interpretation of the universal claim. Remember that the traditional interpretation or the Aristotelian interpretation of the universal claim is that there is the assumption of existential import, which is to say there's the assumption that a member of the subject class exists. You'll notice from the list here that this assumption makes possible quite a number of uh, um, uh, inferences. Things get a little bit complex, so you're going to probably want to think of how you might uh, bear in mind what the inferences are that are uh, valid on this interpretation, and then every other inference is uh, undetermined or invalid. Okay, so what we're going to do is build first our traditional interpretation of the uh, inferences we make around the square of opposition. And when I say build, what I mean is this. You can see already 
that we have in the four corners of the left uh, pane or the left side of your screen, the uh, A, E, and I, and O propositions. And what we're going to start with is the inferences uh, that we can make from A to I and E to O. In other words, we're going to talk about subalternation and we'll talk about why it is the case that under certain circumstances you can't infer the uh, A from the I or the E from the O and why under certain circumstances, and that will be the next slide, you can't infer the I from the A or the O from the E. But let's start with the A proposition and the uh, uh, T in parentheses is the assumption that the A proposition is true. Now look at the blue arrow associated with that truth value. And it allows us, you can see, to infer um, a true I. So if an A proposition is true, the I proposition is true. Why is that the case? Well, take a look on the right side of your screen, and you'll see the first bullet point says all SRP, and then there's a further uh, note, we assume there is a member of the S class. So if we're saying all SRP and there is an S, that means that it must be the case that some SRP. Now drop your eye to the third bullet point on the right side. What if we start with a true I proposition? Notice the two examples. When we start with a true I proposition, Sometimes the universal, that is the superaltern, is false, and sometimes it's true. So when we say it's true that some dogs are beagles, therefore all dogs are beagles, we've drawn an erroneous inference because the claim all dogs are beagles is false. And on the other hand, when we start with a different true, I claim some cats are animals, we can draw a true superaltern, that is a true universal affirmative, all cats are animals. So now draw your, your eye back over to the AI relationship. More specifically, look at the true I proposition, the second T in parentheses, and you'll see that the arrow going upwards leads to a question mark which is to say that if the I proposition is true, the A proposition is undetermined. Why is the A proposition undetermined? Well, we just saw two examples where when starting from an I proposition that's true, we sometimes get a true A and we sometimes get a false A. In other words, we're dependent on looking at the content in order to understand the inference. And since in logic, we want to avoid looking at the content to see if the inference is legitimate or not, we will say that we cannot infer the superaltern from the subaltern. Now, if you cast your eye over to the EO relationship, you'll see that it mirrors the AI, or another way to put it is the AI mirrors the EO we can infer the subaltern from the universal proposition. The subaltern is the subaltern that corresponds to the universal. So a true E yields a true O, a true A yields a true I, but just as with the IA inference, the OE inference is undetermined. When the O is true, the E is undetermined, just like when the I is true, the A is undetermined. Go ahead and pause for a moment and read through the examples. You'll see that we have the same assumption for the E proposition as we do for the A. That is, we assume there is a member of the subject class. On this assumption, there must be at least one S member, 
which means that when the E is true, the O is true. When the A is true, the I is true. But it's not the case that when we start with a true I or a true O, we get a true, respectively, A or E. Now let's look at what happens when we have a false A or a false I, a false E, or a false O. Notice that when the A is false, the I is undetermined. When the E is false, the O is undetermined. Now take a look at the examples. So the first bullet point reads as follows. Suppose all SRP is false. On this assumption, the I proposition is undetermined. Look at the examples. All dogs are beagles, that's false. Some dogs are beagles, that's true. All rabbits are carnivores, that's false. Some rabbits are carnivores, that's false. When the inference is sometimes true, sometimes false, in other words, when the inference is not necessitated, it's undetermined. The same goes for the E to O proposition. That is, we cannot infer the subalternation for a false universal proposition. So suppose that no SRP is false. On this assumption, the O proposition is undetermined. The claim no dogs are pit bulls is false. The claim some dogs are not pit bulls is true. The claim no cats are animals is false. The claim some cats are animal are not animals is also false, or is, yeah, is also false. So you'll see in each of the immediate inferences here, the inference, respectively, some dogs are not pit bulls, some cats are not animals, uh, are true and false. Now cast your eye back to the chart. More specifically, look at the I proposition under the assumption that it's false, and notice that the arrow leading upwards yields a false superaltern. The same goes with the O proposition. When the O is false, the E is false. Take a look at the examples for each before moving on. Now let's take a look at contradictories. Remember that contradictories are propositions that cannot be true at the same time and they cannot be false at the same time. So we don't even need to know the truth value of the premise because the immediate inference, the contradictory, will always have the opposite truth value. So we talked about contradictories in the following way. We said that any statement and its negation cannot be true at the same time. If I utter the sentence, I own an iPhone, and I also utter the sentence, I do not own an iPhone, we would say that I am being self-contradictory or I am asserting self-contradictory statements if I try and claim that it's true that I own and I do not own an iPhone. You would basically say to me, look, Mia, pick one or the other, it can't be both. So, if an A claim is true, the O must be false and vice versa. And if an E claim is true, the I must be false and vice versa. Before moving on, go ahead and pause the video so that you can take a look at the examples. Now, I do want to point out uh, before we move on that the examples that I give you are meant to pump your intuitions about the uh, correctness or illegitimacy of certain inferences. But what we want to bear in mind and what will be helpful to us um, as we move forward to understanding this uh, notion is that the logical structure, not the content, is what makes an inference legitimate or illegitimate. So when I say when we move on, I'm thinking of the Venn diagrams that will offer us a visual representation of the logical structure of each of these proposition types. Now let's move on to contraries. Universals are contraries. Take a look at the top blue bar. 
it's a bar rather than arrows because contradictory or sorry contraries um, do not have a reciprocal relationship with each other here's what i mean contraries can't both be true but they can both be false so in order for us to draw an inference from a universal to its contrary we need to know that that universal is true so take a look at the a proposition and the second arrow that goes from a to e or sorry the second line which is an arrow that goes from a to e so the first arrow goes from a to e and that is an arrow that tells us if the a proposition is true the e must be false now look at the third line or the second arrow if the e proposition is true the a must be false if like i said before the e proposition or the a proposition is false in other words um, we start with a false universal the contrary may be true may be false we just don't know that's another way of saying what i had mentioned before when i said both universals can be false at the same time that means then that when we start with a false universal our inference is undetermined go ahead and take a look at each of the examples before we move on the correlate to contraries is this pair of inf inferences known as subcontraries so take your eyes down to your particular claims i and o you'll notice that on the very bottom you have a bar that like the uh, bar um, in the a and e proposition references is um, a blank in other words there's no directional arrow and that tells you that i and o and o and i inferences that is subcontraries do not bear a reciprocal relationship to each other just as contraries don't bear a reciprocal relationship to each other you have to know the truth value of the premise and even then knowing the truth value of the premise might not or will not always give you the immediate inference or a necessary immediate inference so subcontraries can't both be false but both can be true so if an i proposition is false so look at the top uh, bar the first arrow if the i proposition is false the o must be true if the o proposition is false the i must be true the o to i inference is your second uh, arrow and the second bar if you will in the series so let's take a look at a couple of examples we know that some phones i'm sorry some iphones are androids is false the subcontrary some iphones are not androids is true some guitars are not stringed instruments is false some guitars are stringed instruments is true so you must know first that your particular proposition is false in order to draw the necessary inference that its subcontrary is true on the other hand it may be the case that your uh, two particular claims your subcontraries are both true at the same time so because if you start with a true particular you may end up with a true or a false subcontrary the inference from a true particular to its subcontrary is undetermined take a look at the examples you'll notice that when you start with a true i you sometimes get a true o you sometimes get a false o the same with starting with a true o you sometimes get a true i you sometimes get a false i because the inference is undetermined we don't allow that inference as a necessary inference what we've been looking at 
is the square of opposition from the traditional standpoint. And remember what that means. That means that we assume a member of the subject class in our two universal claims exists. So what we're going to want to do is distinguish between what's known as existential import which is what reflects the traditional interpretation of the universal claim from not assuming existential import, which is what reflects the modern interpretation of the universal claim. And when we understand the traditional Venn diagram, we understand in a new way or another way or a way that illuminates for us the inferences we are and are not allowed to make on the square of opposition. We'll also see why on the modern interpretation of the square of opposition, there is just one set of inferences allowed, contradictories, A and O and E and I. Okay, so let me show you what you're looking at. If you uh, take a look at the uh, two circles, remember that we said when we're diagramming our propositions, rather than nesting circles or um, coming up with a different type of diagram for each uh, uh, proposition type, if we have two overlapping circles or two circles with an area of overlap, then that becomes our template for any of the four proposition types. These are called Venn diagrams. Now, the shading that you see, or in this specific case, the red lines, uh, is going to represent emptiness. It's another way of saying that whatever S's there may be, they're all dumped into that area of overlap between the S and the P class. So on the traditional interpretation, when we say all S are P, we're saying that there's not even one S that is in the area of S outside of P. And by the way, the red circle, uh, sorry, the red uh, X that circled tells us that in fact, we assume there is an S. So think about it this way. When we say all dogs are animals, we assume there exists at least one member of the dog class. But now drop your eye down to the modern interpretation. The modern interpretation suspends judgment about existential import. And this helps us an awful lot when we think about propositions where we are pretty confident that the subject class is empty. All leprechauns are gold hoarders. All werewolves are frightening creatures. All vampires are blood-sucking uh, uh, undead. Those uh, subject classes, leprechauns, werewolves, and vampires, don't have any members. So the modern interpretation says, look, whether we are talking about dogs, cats, tables, chairs, vampires, werewolves, leprechauns, fairies, whatever, we're not going to assume a member of the subject class that is going to um, just complicate our inferences. In other words, the modern interpretation uh, says that by not assuming existential import, we free ourselves completely from ever needing to know about the truth value of the proposition in question. Now let's take a look at the Venn diagrams for E propositions. The traditional interpretation, again, assumes a member of the subject class. And just as an aside, um, technically both the S and the P class uh, uh, assume membership, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But you can see that in both the traditional and the modern interpretation, the area of overlap is shaded. What that means is that the area of overlap between S and P is empty. There's nothing there. There can't be anything there. The traditional interpretation says no SRP, and by the way, we're assuming a member of the S class. The modern, modern interpretation says no SRP, and we don't assume a member of the S class exists. 
Now, the Venn diagrams for I and O propositions are the same in both the modern and traditional interpretations because the modern and traditional interpretations are of the universal propositions alone. The interpretations do not impact at all the particular or existential claims, some S or P, some S or not P. Your I proposition has an X in the area of overlap, which denotes that there is an S and it's also a P. That's why it's in the area of overlap. The X outside the S class in the O proposition says there is an S and it is outside the P class. Another way you might consider this when you're thinking about the concept of distribution is that the P class rejects or uh, um, uh, precludes any S from um, uh, participating in it or from being uh, a part of it. So there is at least one S that is completely outside of P. Now let's look at the traditional square of opposition and our Venns. First, look at your two left side uh, propositions. You've got your universal affirmative in the upper left corner and your particular affirmative in the bottom left corner. Notice that the A proposition includes the S, pro or sorry, includes the I proposition. All SRP assumes a member of the S class, hence, if all SRP is true, some SRP is also true. Notice that the same is the case with the E and the O propositions. Those are in your respectively upper right and lower right columns. Remember, A is in the upper left, I is in the lower left, E is in the upper right, O is in the lower right. No SRP includes a member of the subject class, which makes some S are not P true. Now let's take a look at your contradictories because I think that the Venn diagrams are really going to help you understand how it is that contradictories um, look or what it is, what the logical structure of the propositions are such that if an A is true, the O must be false. So notice that in an A proposition, the S area outside of P is empty. Emptiness means there's nothing there. So if there's nothing there, you couldn't possibly have an X in the S area. Now take a look at the universal negative, the E claim. The E claim asserts that the area of overlap between S and P is empty. And if that's the case, there can't be an X in the area of overlap. Notice also that if, now look at the O claim again, if the O claim is true, if there is one member of the S class that's outside of P, that means there's a member of the S class in the area that is outside of the P class. If that's true, then the A claim diagonally to your uh, left, upper left, can't be true. And the same also with your I and your E. So the diagrams help us understand how it is that contradictories work. Take a few minutes to think about, by way of your diagrams, how contraries, subcontraries, subalternation, and superalternation work or don't work based on our previous discussion of truth values. I hope this tutorial has helped you understand the basics of the modern square and the traditional square of opposition. We have some more immediate inferences that we need to study, but at this point, you're pretty well armed to make the transition to those immediate inferences known as obversion, conversion, and contraposition. We will study those just as we did the, the uh, square of opposition from both the modern and traditional standpoints.